I, I've been open about this. I mean, I saw an object when I was young as a, as a paper boy, uh, and it went right over my head. It was, you know, it was un, uh, unmistakable, uh, you know, that it was not supposed to be there. So that when the whole subject of what UFOs or whatnot might be, I could look back on that and say, well, you know, in, insofar as what everybody else is claiming this to be, that was a UFO. Um, but, you know, as I, I explained this to, to um, Avi at one point, uh, it, it's an anecdote. Mm. And so it is not sufficient for me to use that as proof of anything except to myself. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, when I talk about uh, these, these subjects with Tom DeLong, he mentioned a problem that he has, but he's not a scientist, so he could get away with it. And that was that he claimed to have alien technology, an artifact from a, a downed uh, craft. Um, and he claims that it's 100% genuine. We have material from a purported crash in the late 40s. We don't really have a chain of title all the way back then. We do for like 20 years or something. We know there's a lot of uh, anomalies about the way it's engineered. We have some theories of what it can do. There's been a lot of studies on it. The government's very interested in this piece. But if that piece ended up being real, then it's like, well, what else was it a part of and who was piloting this thing? Was it a drone? Was it not? However, the means by which he acquired it cannot be either divulged or reproduced. In other words, there's a chain of custody problem that Avi and I don't suffer from, right? If Avi and I look at a uh, at a muon, uh, their muons are like commodities. They're fungible. One muon, you've seen one muon, you've seen them all. Um, they're they're interchangeable. Uh, but but alien craft aren't. And so therefore, it's very important, the provenance, so to speak. And I, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, from your excursions, what do you make of, of the claims of, say, a Tom DeLong or, or a Jacques Vallée, who yeah. I know you, you've worked with? Well, if he's if he's talking about the uh, the, the so-called um, magnesium bismuth metamaterial, um, you know, I, I have pieces of that. Uh, and I don't think that there is sufficient evidence at this point to claim that is clearly, uh, you know, from an extraterrestrial vehicle. Um, that said, I don't think that sufficient analysis has, has been done on it. It does have slightly altered magnesium ratios. I've, I've looked at that myself, but they're not so far off that they that they can't be um, construed as some other sort of reason for. In, in the in the making of it, so I'm, it, unless he's talking about something else, I I don't I don't know, and nor have I seen it uh, the the evidence, and so it's I, I I put it into the into the anecdote category, and I like Tom. I mean I'm I, I'm a yeah. you know he's a friend, uh, but I I haven't seen anything else. Mm -hmm. Now I have been given uh, pieces of material that do have chains of evidence. This is the so-called Ubatuba event where we did do a very detailed uh, analysis using secondary ion mass spec of the isotope ratios of two pieces. One was, com and we did it in the same instrument at the same time under the same vacuum conditions. Uh, one piece was perfectly conventional uh, magnesium ratios. The other were way off. I mean, so far off as to be, the only thing that I could imagine is it was manufactured. Now that doesn't prove it's, a UAP it doesn't prove it was alien. Right. It just says to me somebody back in the seventies spent a lot of money to change the isotope ratios and then blew it up over a beach in Brazil. And so the only question it raises to me is who would do that and why would they do it? Right. I mean, because we don't use isotopes for anything other than either medical reasons or blowing stuff up. Just a quick pause to ask you for a small favor. While my thumb is occupied with old Albert on it, yours is presumably freed up to leave a thumbs up on this video. It really helps me a lot with a good old fashioned YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot. Now back to the video. I think scientists are like children. I mean, we don't play well with others. We're very jealous. We like attention and we, and we don't like to share our toys, right? So I want to ask Gary, when, our, when we see things like this, and Avi, please, you too. Uh, and I just want to remind everybody, we're talking about Avi Loeb, Gary Nolan, uh, some of the most eminent uh, scientists uh, who happen to have turned at great personal risk. And I want to say this with respect. Um, I don't have the courage that you guys do. I, I kind of do this because I believe that we as scientists have a moral obligation 
to share the data, to share the uh, discoveries in a way that our tax paying public who pay our freaking salary. I don't care. You guys are at private institutions. I'm at a public institution, but you guys are supported by the public at a very deep level as well. I just want to put that out there. I feel it's my moral obligation to share, but I don't have the courage to go out on a limb, to go on Tucker Carlson, like, like Gary, to go on the various outlets that, that you've gone on as well, Avi, because I, 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 I'm worried. I'm worried about the, the, obviously there's, there's career risk, et cetera, but there's also kind of a intellectual capture that occurs when, when you believe something to be true that no one else maybe agrees with you or very few of your colleagues agree with you. It's a very lonely place. And, and I, I'm just saying in all honesty, not many scientists have that courage. Not many uh, people have that courage. Courage is the rarest of all human emotions, in my opinion. So I just want to express that. But I do want to say, along the lines of data, I've heard people say, and when Avi was on with Eric Weinstein, we, we heard things like, the data is ours. It belongs to the public. I don't know if I necessarily disagree that the data belongs to the public. But don't we have an obligation as scientists, Gary, to interpret the data are very complex. Someone who's watching this channel may be a lay person, very bright, brilliant. I mean, the smartest audience in the universe uh, watches this channel. But do they have the tools to assess at the level that you do because of your access, because of the privilege that you have to be a scientist? Can an average lay person really understand what it is that maybe you might be claiming? Or, or is it your job to explain it in a way that they could? Well, this is a belong yeah, I mean, to basically. I mean, I, I, again, I, this is kind of a, literally a riff on what, um, on what Avi just said. I don't think of, frankly, what we're doing as courageous. I'm just doing what I thought science was teaching me to do, mm. right? And that's really what Avi was saying is that, you know, that, that, that if, if, if science is about following rules that somebody else wrote on stone tablets, then science is done, right? And so uh, I've spent my whole career doing things that people told me shouldn't or couldn't be done. Like when I was doing starting companies back in the early 90s, or mid nineties, I was told you're going to, you know, destroy your career. You shouldn't do it. Now everybody does it. Right. And people, people who used to come to me and tell me I'm ruining my career, come and ask me how to start a company. Uh, so that's, that's fine. So I don't consider it, I don't consider it courageous. I'm just doing what I think we're supposed to be doing. 